Glory to Jesus Christ. So we're reading the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And we're in part one, the profession of faith. Section nine, the Catholic Church. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Uh, Article nine of the Nicene Creed. I mean, the Apostles' Creed. And uh, the... Catechism of the Catholic Church is published by Libreia Editrice Vaticana. This is the second edition published in 2016, and this is the second reprint in 2019. And you can get this also from a Catholic culture. You can get a PDF drive, free download ebook of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Or you can get it from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops dot org slash sites slash default slash files slash flipbooks slash Catechism of the Catholic Church. Or www.vatican.va Catechism of the Catholic Church English. And then, of course, you go to part one. You scroll down part one to... Uh, Article 9 and uh, Roman numeral 1, the Church, the People of God, and it's 781, which is the most important number to have, 781. So let's pray in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. <coughs> this is paragraph 2, People of God, Body of Christ, Temple of the Holy Spirit, uh, Images of the Church. O oh, heavenly King, comfort a spirit of truth who are everywhere present and filling all things, O oh, treasury of blessings and giver of life. Come dwell within us and cleanse our souls, O oh, gracious Lord, holy God, holy mighty, one holy immortal, one of mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, one holy immortal, one of mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, one holy immortal, one of mercy on us. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Roman numeral to the body of Christ. Wait a minute. I missed it already. Roman numeral one, the people of God. At all times and in every race, anyone who fears God and does what is right has been acceptable to him. He has, however, willed to make men holy and save them, not as individuals without any bond or link between them, but rather to make them into a people who might acknowledge him and serve him in holiness. He therefore chose the Israelite race to be his own people and establish a covenant with it. He gradually instructed this people. All these things, however, happened as a preparation for and figure of the new and perfect covenant which was to be ratified in Christ. The new covenant in his blood, he has called together a race made up of Jews and Gentiles, which would be one, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Lumen Gentium 9, uh, citing Acts 10.35 and 1 Corinthians 11.25. Characteristics of the people of God. So when, when we were, we're, we're looking at Lumen Gentium, in, on Sundays in the uh, documents of Vatican II. And the uh, people of God is one of the favorite uh, images, titles of the church, because what we're living, that includes everybody, body of Christ, uh, another image, that the people of God, uh, living, active, uh, one, a holy nation, uh, as uh, the New Testament calls, calls the church as well. Characteristics of the people of God. The people of God is marked by characteristics that clearly distinguish it from all other religious, ethnic, political, or cultural groups found in history. So we're not an ethnic group. We're not a political group. We're not a cultural group. We are a religious group. But we're distinct from every other group, and we're made up of every other group, of every race, 
people language, as the book of Revelation says. It is, this is 782. It is the people of God. God is not the property of any one people. So uh, the Jews did not have a monopoly on God. And nobody does. But it is the people of God. God is not property of any other people, nor is he property of any individual. It's the other way around. We belong to God, and thus, in our giving ourselves wholly to God, to respond to that call of grace, God belongs to us. God belongs to us insofar as we belong to God. But he, he is the one who called us first. I... Uh, 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 you have not chosen me, I have chosen you, Jesus said. Well, of course, we have chosen him, but only because he's chosen us. And his choice is universal. He chooses everyone to come to grace. How he does that is not always evident. The ordinary means, but not the usual means, is through the sacraments. And uh, we who know better should be making frequent recourse to the sacraments and frequent renewal of the sacraments that we receive only once in our lifetime, such as baptism, and in my case, ordination. So, and confirmation also, chrismation. So, but he acquired a people for himself from those who previously were not a people, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. First Peter 2.9. So a chosen race, the, the human race, but in a sense chosen out of the human race because we respond to the call. So, you know, if a dog is called by the owner and the dog responds, it's not merely because the dog has chosen the owner to respond to the owner, which he has to do, but that the owner first chose the dog to own the dog. A chosen race, a royal priesthood. So in baptism, we receive the, the priesthood of, of, of faith. That is the priesthood of baptism, on which is built the particular priesthood, that is the ministerial priesthood of priests, a deacon, priest, uh, that is to say, presbyter and bishop and a bishop having the fullness of the ministerial priesthood. But the priesthood of all believers, the priesthood of baptism, uh, is the foundational priesthood. That's the salvific priesthood. Uh, this doesn't uh, diminish the importance of ministerial priesthood or the uniqueness of it, nor does it replace it. But it is the foundational priesthood, the priesthood uh, that we all have who respond to grace. And why is it a priesthood? Because of prayer. We're called to prayer. Prayer is not just the vocation of uh, contemplatives in monasteries. Uh, it is not just the domain of quote unquote professionals, the priests, deacons, bishops, uh, and folk like that. It's the obligation and the privilege of everyone who is baptized into Christ, and even those uh, yearning for union with God who aren't baptized. So we're all called to pray, and uh, adoration of God, God alone, the Trinity, thanksgiving to God, and also thanksgiving to everybody else. And uh, repentance, to repent of our sins and to pray in reparation for the sins of other people, that they might repent. And intercession. We're all mediators in the one mediator with the Father. We're all called to be intercessors for one another. We're to be uh, canals cut off the great river of, of grace, to Jesus Christ. Uh, but we're canals that cut into each other. We're to bring the water of grace to each other as well as to get it directly from Christ. And we're to spread that. We're to uh, 
which and to which to pray for each other. And there was a priest I know who's up for beatification, Father Joseph Monteith. Uh, and he used to ask me all the time, but he used to ask everybody, I'm told, oh, uh, pray for me, and is there anything you'd like me to pray for? He used to ask that whenever he'd drop by St. Edward's Rectory. And I was always, uh, I was almost embarrassed by how reverent he treated me this newly ordained, this uh, nobody in the uh, in the scale of the church, how he treated me with such respect and how he valued my prayers and he valued the prayers of the housekeeper. He valued everybody's prayers and he asked, you know, to pray for everybody else. He was, he was a, a person of great intercession and um, A royal priesthood, a royal priesthood. Because we're why are we royal? We're adopted by God. Why are we royal? We're in the image of the King of Kings. But spiritually, we're quite called the spitting image. I always wondered why they call it spitting, but uh, of God. Now, our likeness, however, is often much obscured by sin. But grace can scrub us. We can, the power of repentance can transform us. Grace can uh, not just transfigure us, but transform us. And so we're royal, we're adopted by God. God the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit by the merits of the incarnate Son. And a holy nation. So our, uh, we're reminded, what it's in called, our citizenship is in heaven, in Christ Jesus, whose return we long for will come to save us. So uh, we're privileged to have the citizenship of our countries. Some of us have citizenship to more than one country. But that's not salvific, as, uh, as called as we are to patriotism and to uh, promoting the just principles of our, of our nations and also of transforming our nations into being ever more just, ever more. Um, but our, the citizenship that really matters, because all, all the nations will eventually dissolve, uh, and my citizenship here will end with my death. But, but the citizenship of heaven is everlasting. And that's the one that matters the most, that I'm living that citizenship. Yes, of course, I should be a very active and strong citizen, hard-working citizen of my country, and very much involved, which is one of the problems that uh, just and well-informed people, good people, are often not all that involved uh, with the state, which is often why the state is in such, such problems. And we support politicians who are often uh, uh, advocates of mass murder, uh, mass theft, all sorts of other things, uh, because it's convenient, or because there's a particular thing we can personally get out of that politician, that we, so we don't care what the person's, uh, not only positions are, but what that person's working towards. Uh, but we have to, uh, uh, citizenship of heaven should uh, illuminate our citizenship of our country, whatever it is. So not that uh, we need a theocracy. Uh, usually theocracies become uh, totalitarian dictatorships of some sort, and often very violent, even though they'll claim not to be. That often is what happens. Uh, uh, we need a real theocracy, that beginning in our hearts, in our lives. We need to be living as citizens of heaven. So, and putting that into effect. So, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. First Peter 2, 9. One becomes a member of this people, not only by physical birth, but by being born anew, born again. A birth of water in the Holy Spirit, that is baptism. Uh, Baptism now saves you, St. Peter reminds us. 
that is by faith in Christ and baptism. Because it's not enough to be baptized and not live it. We have to live it. It's not enough to go to confession. We have to live it. It's not enough to go to communion. We have to live it. It's not enough to stand up in front of the altar for a, a, a wedding ceremony. We have to live it. We have to live our confirmation. And I have to live my ordination. So... Uh, And if we survive being anoint, anointing of the sick, we have to live that too. So um, we're born again at birth of water and the spirit that Jesus talks about in John 3, 3 through 5. So there were those who don't believe in baptism and regeneration who try to get around that and say, oh, that's uh, the uh, water when uh, just before you're born that comes out of your mother. Uh, that's uh, really stretching it, shall we say, and, and has no basis in... In, in scripture or tradition. But what does have a basis in scripture and tradition is baptismal regeneration. As St. Peter said, there's no mere washing away of a physical stain. It's not just some vague symbolism of something that already happened. It's uh, the power of the experience of grace. Regenerating grace, transforming grace. But it has to be lived. It has to be renewed. So it's like a plant. Let's say someone gives me this potted plant. And I forget all about it. And then I come back and it's dead. Well, I can't complain to the person who gave it to me. Unless it were a plastic plant, then maybe. But um, uh, I'm to blame. I have the, the water is there. All I have to do is pour it onto the plant. The same is true in living out our baptism. We have to participate in it. We have to cooperate with that. And the same is true of living out any grace. There's no such thing as irresistible grace. Grace has to be cooperated with. But our very ability to cooperate with grace is because of grace, this prevenient grace, because we're fallen and we can't get up, as the old commercial used to say. by faith in Christ and baptism. So the two. By water and the Holy Spirit. The people has for its head Jesus Christ. So he's the everlasting head of the church. The Pope is a temporary uh, subhead, if you want to call it that. Uh, someone I knew was learning English and thought it was strange to call uh, a pope or a bishop, like a bishop at the head of the local church or the pastor of the head of the... He said, how many heads does the church have? Is it that... He said, having more than one head is a monster. So I said, well, then don't use that imagery because that's not what the imagery means for us. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's one everlasting head of the Church of Heaven and Earth, and that's Jesus Christ. But we have his chief steward, that's the Pope. And yes, uh, local churches have heads. You even talk about the head of the St. Vincent de Paul Society. You just talk of, of uh, heads of groups and subgroups. That's a, a very common use in English. Chief. And so, um, so, you know, the bishop is the head of the diocese. The pastor is the head of the parish. All this stuff, the... Uh, the patriarch is the head of, of the uh, ritual church, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, but of course, the higher you are up in the hierarchy, the greater your responsibilities and the greater your accountability on this. Not only to God, who is the ultimate conquer, because remember, uh, the Pope doesn't uh, really run the shop because he doesn't own the shop. He uh, manages the shop, and uh, it's, it's Christ who's the owner of the church. We're the property of God, the living and free property of God, the rational property of God, the, uh, because that image can only go so far. The people has its head, Jesus Christ, the anointed, the Messiah, 
because the same anointing, the Holy Spirit, flows from the head into the body. So just think of the bloodstream, the blood getting to all of the cells to give them life. So, uh, but uh, because it comes, it's pumped by the heart. But and here in this image, like it says, it would come from the head, stuff like that, from Christ. By Christ is also, you could say, the heart of the body, the sacred heart of the body. Another image. So we're a messianic people. We're a, a priestly people. We're uh, the anointed people, Messiah, Hamashiach, the anointed one. The status of this people is that of the dignity and freedom of the sons of God. So the, the adopted children of God the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit by the merits of, of the incarnate Son, in whose hearts the Holy Spirit dwells as in a temple. So yes, we're a temple of Christ, we're a temple of the Father, we're a temple of the Holy Spirit, we're a temple of the Trinity. But in a special way, the Holy Spirit, thinking of that, the, this is a, a characteristic of the personality of the, of the Holy Spirit in many ways. Yes, every action of God is indivisible. They're, they're all the hypothesis of the Trinity, the three of them, always act together because they're one being. And they have one purpose. And they have uh, one love and all that. One essence, one being, one substance, one nature. So, it is law. Its law is the new commandment of, to love as Christ taught us. So it says, St. Paul says, He who loves fulfills the whole law. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. For it's John. The law is the new commandment as Christ loved us. John thirteen thirty four. This is the new law of the Holy Spirit. So the barbarisms uh, of the old law are abolished. Uh, <clears throat> the incompleteness of the old law is fulfilled in the new covenant. <clears throat> Christ has fulfilled the law in himself. But uh, the, the ritual law, the, you know, the Iron Age primitivenesses are, are uh, either fulfilled, elevated, or abolished. Um, in Christ and in the New Covenant. It's the Old Covenant, the Antique Covenant, is not abolished, but fulfilled. What is, you know, what is abolished are the, are the, the sins uh, that uh, one could uh, easily, and even enthusiastically embrace uh, from a false and superficial reading of the Old Testament, especially the Torah regulations and, and the vindictiveness and all this other stuff. Which is why, well, we can believe, and we do, that the Old Testament is inspired, that it is truly the written Word of God. But uh, it's only uh, applicable as the Word of God if, we, if it's interpreted in the light of God as love, and in, in, uh, in concord with natural law and, uh, and going beyond that into the, the, the Catholic covenant, the universal covenant, that everybody's invited into this, not just people descended or claiming descent from Abraham or, or Jacob or, or Judah. Its law is the new commandment, to love as Christ loved us. This is the new law of the Holy Spirit. See Romans 8, 2 and Galatians 5, 25. Just page 207. Its mission is to be salt of the earth and light of the world. This people is the most sure seed of unity, hope, and salvation for the whole human race. So, which means we have to live as a church, which is why the devil wants above all else to prevent us from living as the sons of God, to prevent us from living uh, uh, the life of virtue, uh, to prevent, and, uh, and to prevent us from spreading this. 
Its destiny, finally, is the kingdom of God. So the church is the kingdom of God in seed, but it's also the herald of the kingdom, the sign pointing to the kingdom as well. Finally, it's the kingdom of God which has begun by God himself on earth and which must be further extended until it has been brought to perfection by him at the end of time. So that's see Matthew five thirteen through sixteen and Lumen Gentium nine two. Okay, we'll stop there and let's pray the Our Father, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So let's see who's waving. Eileen Rainey. Hi there. Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. Bye.